Yes, who doesn't? Oh, yes. Three, two, one. Oaxaca in the house. Welcome back, everybody, to the Strategy Sprints podcast. I'm your host, Simon Severino, and today we are in Oaxaca, southern Mexico, where we meet co-founder of the Rebel Business School, which has helped over 9,000 entrepreneurs get going without debt. The next big thing he's working on is a TV show based on helping people build businesses around passion and without debt. Welcome, everybody, Alan Donegan. Yay! I'll cheer myself, seeing as there's no one else but the two of us. Uh, it's lovely to meet you. Thank you for having me on the show. I am excited to be here. Everybody is excited to have you here. And uh, what are you currently creating? Uh, my wife and I are building a, a course called the Rebel Finance School to teach people how to manage their money and reach financial independence. So that's kind of like something that we're building together. Uh, I did a Google talk last week. So I've spent two months building the slides, rehearsing it. Um, wow. That was a big and, project. Woo! And, and we get the benefits because you are so prepared. <laughs> uh, and then we spend our time giving it all away. And I guess the last thing we're creating at the moment like like every business owner, you want to have proof that your business actually has impact for the clients you're working with. So we've just done a five-year study where we've done five workshops over five years in the same uh, London borough. And we've gone back to everyone who came on the courses and asked, did it work? Five years later, do you have a business? Does it work? What happened? Uh, are you happier? Are you less happy? Um, so we've been building a longitudinal study to prove our methodology works. Um, wow. Cool. Longitudinal. I love it. And, you know, you're here, you're preaching to the choir because we are bootstrapped. We have always had only one person uh, founding the company. That's the client. And for me, there, there, there really is no other thing. Uh, just in the worst case, worst case, I would accept third parties paying for, for me building the business. But the reality out there is different. The reality is how, many, how much percentage of the businesses out there uh, are in, in debt. Well, it's, it's all based on a belief that it takes money to make money and that I need to get the funding first to be able to launch the business. And this is propagated by pretty much everyone. Um, and even in, in the UK, we have something called the Startup Loans Company, which the government built to be able to give money to startups. Uh, and I scratch my head like 40% of the loans they've lent in the UK have defaulted. So this, this is not just they've not paid them back. This is like defaulted. The business hasn't worked. And I find it shocking that so many people think you need money to get going. And I know, I know we both understand you don't, but it's a general belief in the population that I need a loan and a business plan. And uh, it's just not true. Let's help. Let's help uncover this a little bit. So there, there are situations where it is true, like you need to create such complex machinery, building hardware that is that needs so long time to build. But while I am saying this, I am thinking, why not build the prototype quicker and see if people would buy it and then build it? Yes, let's pre-sell because even the, I love that, you, your own example, you went, mm, I'm not sure that's a good one. Yeah, but I've never found a business you can't start for free if you pre-sell, if you find partners, if you borrow equipment, if you get free stuff. Um, Pre-sales tends to be the golden bullet of sorting these things out because if you've got that piece of software or that piece of hardware you're saying you need the machinery to build, well, if you can find the client who will help fund the creation of it because they really want it, well, then you know you have a market need, you have your first customer, and you have the money to be able to build it. 
So why wouldn't you pre-sell? Um, most of the time, people don't want to pre-sell because they're nervous of the answer. Innovating on the job. You innovate in a paid project, which in this case would be a service business. It's a consulting project where you build something for somebody else. But by doing that, you are building the first prototype. And, and you innovate paid by somebody. It's the best type of innovation. Why would you pay for your own innovation when you can find a customer to pay you to do it? And over the history of what we've been doing, we've helped people to find customers first. And it's incredible. You get paid to do what you want to do, which is to uncover something, launch something, build something. So, yeah, to everyone listening to this, stop trying to build everything first and be perfect and sell first and create second. That's that's the way to do entrepreneurship without the traditional risk of putting your house on the line, taking a big loan, all of that stuff. Sell first, build second. That's beautiful. I want a T-shirt, sell first, create second. Yes, because yeah, this can save, literally, this can save lives right now. So many businesses right now are struggling to you know, adapt their offer, um, pivot, uh, build something that is really needed right now, not after the pandemic, right now. And um, this is so relevant. Uh, maybe we start by, by sharing just your story. How did you start your current business? <laughs> uh, well, actually, there was a particular inflection point that happened before this business. I went to the British government for help starting my own business, and they gave me three workshops. They gave me how to write a business plan. Super <laughs> exciting. It's uh, the worst. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a waste of time, people. If you are listening to this, writing a business plan is a waste of time. It's a beautiful work of fiction most of the time. Uh, it's all made up. So they gave me the business plan workshop, the finance workshop, which was basically a code word for how to get debt, uh, and then a marketing workshop. And they did more to put me off starting a business than they did to actually help me. And I have a loving mum. I'm. I had some money in the bank. Like, I have some advantages. And the thought occurred to me, like, if they're doing this to me, they're putting me off. What are they doing to everyone else? And that was the seed of there must be a better way to build a business. There must be a better way. Uh, and I complained to the British government telling them their service was bad, <laughs> as you do. And uh, they sent someone to fix me. And the guy they sent to fix me, his name was Simon. And he turned up and he became my business partner. And we built the Rebel Business School together to do what we both felt the British government failed to do themselves. You fixed him. So <laughs> I'm not sure he would like it if you said that. But yes, I think we tried to fix each other. <laughs> I hope that these institutions are listening right now because let's try also to help this institution. Maybe they don't know better. If you don't know better, uh, Hear, hear, hear it from people who build businesses for, for a living. The, the business plan, you are wasting the time of everybody, especially when you want 20 pages. One page is enough, and it's about what's the problem, how can you solve it, why are you the right team to solve it, and how will you start, and how will you measure progress. If you get that on a page, that's a good business plan. Don't spend more than 30 minutes on it and go cranking. The financial workshop, great workshop if it takes two hours and it explains cash flow management, not how to raise money, how to manage your current money to, to find out what to build first. That's cash flow management. And I think I'd add one last piece in there that so many of the institutions that teach this stuff ask you to research on Google to find out the size of the total market. And I'm sure you've had this, how many business plans you've seen that say, the market is worth 75 billion. If I can just capture 1% of this market and my head sinks, like stop researching on Google and go and talk to a customer. 
you will learn more in a half an hour interaction with a real customer than you will from two weeks of learning on Google. Like, go talk to customers. And I don't know if you've had that experience as well, Simon, but that's the, our advice. The TAM, Total Addressable Market. Two things, I could go for days about this. <laughs> two things that I hate about this because they are just wrong. And we, we need, we, we are responsible for, for telling these people. Total addressable market is wrong for two reasons. First, let's say you Google it right, you find out that the automotive um, uh, market potential is 8 billion in your country. Okay, beautiful. But that doesn't, need, doesn't mean that your launch will, will catch any of that. Because yes, if you're Elon Musk, maybe, but you are probably not. So forget it. You are talking about numbers of other people because it's not just a total addressable market. It's your market access of that piece of a total addressable market. And your, your market access, guess what? It's how many people you can contact today. And that's what you should be doing, starting the conversations with these people. The second thing is people think they should go for a big total addressable market. And it is totally wrong. Because when you start, you need it as small as possible so, and so that you can excel, that you can have the best solution in there. And from there, you will later on, much later, three years later, five years later, expand to adjacent small total addressable markets. And this is how you grow. I, I'm in total agreement. We phrase it slightly differently, but with exactly the same thing. People go for the biggest market possible. Uh, and they go, like, there's so much money in customers, and they go for the big market, whereas what they should really be doing is niche marketing, find the small market that they can become famous in, that they can actually access, talk to people. And I love that. Yes. So, like, I think we're saying exactly the same thing. Go speak to customers. <laughs> like, yeah. Find who you can talk to, call them, visit them, maybe not in COVID times, Zoom them, do something, go and talk to customers. And, and I want your T-shirt, sell first, build later. By the way, if you want a long case study, we have one episode of this show, which is the episode with April Dunford. If you Google April Dunford Strategy Sprints episode, you will find a full case of a beautiful tech startup, a CRM uh, solution that went for very, very niche and became very, very big, sold to the biggest in their industry in a couple of years because they did it right. Um, yeah, so what what are you up to right now? Tell us about your world. Uh, tell us about my world. Well, um, my world turned on its head a couple of years ago because my wife and I reached uh, financial independence. So we've got to the stage where we don't have to work again if we don't want to, which has been fascinating. And the the business, the Rebel Business School, has exploded around the world it's now in seven countries. We hope that the team is there's a team in Colombia running Rebel Business Schools. So I'm going to pop down there after this and meet them. Um, and my wife and I are building finance courses and giving back. And it's really interesting. If you get entrepreneurship right, you can build an extraordinary life for yourself. Extraordinary. It's an incredibly powerful vehicle to build the life of your dreams. Uh, and so we've we're kind of on the other side, enjoying the life of our dreams, if that makes sense. Somebody says, Luana Bosio, I love all posters behind on the wall. What's up with these post-its? <laughs> uh, that's my podcast. Uh, I have a little podcast called the Rebel Entrepreneur Podcast, which is all about building businesses without debt. And those are the episodes that I've been recording, planning, structuring, um, yeah, yeah. So that's what I'm doing on the wall back there is building a podcast and giving it away for free. Cool. Tell us more because people right now listening, they are into podcasts. Tell us about your podcast. Well, it's I wanted to help the world to break exactly what you're talking about, which is to build a business with no debt because people think they need money. So we have an entire series of podcasts to show that I don't care what business it is you want to build. There is a way to do it 
without spending money. So episode 24 was about how to build a restaurant with no money. And people are thinking, well, how do you do that, Alan? And then you've got episode three, which you said the strategy award, like episode three, there's this couple that built an escape room without debt. And everyone thinks you need to take a big loan, secure a lease on a building, build the escape room, and then start to sell it to the public. Oh, even better, and even better. Get government approval, have 27 security guards around it, on it, and below it, and then start. Yes. Uh, so there's this wonderful couple called Katie and Andrew who like on our advice went to try and find a free space to launch the first version so they went round their local town called reading in berkshire in england knocking on doors saying have you got any free space uh, everyone said no all day long until they were just about to quit and they were going back to the car and you can't make this up they saw one last hotel called great expectations uh, and they went into Great Expectations. They met the manager. They had a free room that they didn't know what to do with at the front. Uh, and they did a deal because if they built an escape room there, it would bring people in to the restaurant, into the bar to buy drinks and food and stay at the hotel. And they were able to borrow a room for six weeks for free to launch the first version of their escape room. And Talk about someone who's doing things differently. They're building businesses from profit, not debt. And that, as you know, that's the game. Build from profit, build from sales, don't build from debt. Absolutely. Again, a t-shirt. Absolutely. <laughs> this is beautiful. And it reminds us that entrepreneurs are these, these forces of nature that are able to create something out of nothing. And it's not really out of nothing. It's they see resources unused and they bring them together in a new combination to become used. You see, they, they have something that they need to solve and they have resources unused. Here is another problem. If we bring this problem together, they both solve each other. That's entrepreneurship. Yes. And... After a while, as you start to practice this, you walk around the local city and you go, there's an empty building, there's this. And then you're looking online and people are saying this, and there's an empty resource there, and there's this, and there's that. And I think as you start to open up your mind and your eyes, you'll notice opportunity everywhere. And I think you're exactly right. That's what an entrepreneur ends up doing, is they just see opportunities that other people miss. And there's no real magic. It's just noticing what is not being used, what is available, what is there. And if you notice it and ask, my mum taught me this one, if you don't ask, you don't get. And she keep drumming that into me and I didn't really understand it back then, but she's right. If you don't ask, can I borrow this? Could I use it? Could we work together? If you don't ask, there is zero chance of it ever happening. The next t-shirt I want to have, that's from your mom. <laughs> She would love that. I'll put a picture on the T-shirt with her. <laughs> yes. And it is it is so true and it is so wise. It took me, I think, 40 years to get it. I hope I can teach it. I can pass it on to my kids because it is so important. If it's in your head, it's not really happening. If you get it out, it can happen. Yes. Yes. And one of the things I guess I've learned is that the ability to make things happen, the ability to take an idea and turn it into something real is very rare. People love to talk about ideas. They love to talk about doing things. But the people who actually take it and do it, like that's rare, Simon. And if we, we had, to speak to your audience, we had to say we had, like, what's the thing that will make it going, like do I, stuff, take the ideas and make it real. I always felt that it's rare. And we had a guest here who did some research and some math about it. Uh, Gino Wickman, uh, who you might know, the, the, the EOS guy. He, his newest book is for people launching their first business. And he, he, he did a little bit of research to find out 
um, how many, exactly how many people are of this type of nature. And he found out it's 4%. And of this 4% of the population, uh, half of them are initiators and half of them are integrators. So not even all 4% have the same kind of uh, energy and superpower. So it's really a rare thing. And if you are one of these, um, you are probably unemployable and um, will get into that creative freedom mode that is entrepreneurship. <laughs> and uh, so you, you are not in the UK anymore. You are now in Mexico. How that? Uh, well, we managed to escape before the government travel ban. My wife and I uh, became nomadic at the beginning of 2020, which was possibly the worst year ever to decide to become nomadic, but we did it. And we travel around the world, running the podcast, doing the finance stuff, trying all of the delicious food, because um, that's our bag. And yeah, so we are now nomadic. And I think as you build a business, if you can get it to the stage where you're not involved in the day-to-day -day life and it's running for you, it gives you an incredible amount of freedom. How, so how did you do that first? The, the financial freedom and then the entrepreneurial freedom to, to be above your business. Tell us about that. So the, the financial freedom is like the basis of it is very simple. There is a lot of technical detail, but the basis. So the basis is you earn a certain amount of money and you spend a certain amount of money and there should be a gap between the two. However, in most people's worlds, they earn and spend exactly the same amount of money. So if you can create a gap by increasing your earnings and lowering your spendings and then taking the difference that's in the middle and investing it and you buy an asset. Most people spend all of their money, Simon, on liabilities. They buy uh, furniture, they buy clothing, they buy cars, they buy um, expensive houses to live in. Those are all liabilities. What they don't buy is rental properties, stocks and shares, assets that produce a return. So the basis of it is earn some more, spend less to create a gap between earning and spendings, and then take that and invest it into assets. And the assets my wife and I chose were very simple index funds. So we buy Vanguard index funds for the total stock market, which have grown beautifully over the last few years. Well, they grow on average by 10, 12% a year, like for however long. And uh, now we have more assets producing more income then we need to live. So we don't actually need to work because the assets produce stuff coming in. Um, a new shirt, a new coffee machine is not an asset that won't produce you any money and help you live life. Um, so we just bought assets. Uh, that's the financial independence in what, 120 seconds or something like that. Uh, Beautiful. Assets and post-its, that's what you need people. <laughs> well, I do own shares in the M that make post-its. So every time I buy post-its, I get a little dividend back. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And yes, I, I was even recently, we were talking about how the pandemic has accelerated some things, but it, it has also increased the gap between the people who have and the have nots because people like you, like me, who were wise enough to invest into shares and stocks, our stocks, they got even better during the pandemic. And, and, and so the gap in society is getting bigger. But right now, our topic is how we can share these things that work so that other people start early on in their career, start early on uh, spending, uh intentionally and think about what what brings you return long term versus not i love the coffee machine example and uh, <laughs> for i am an, an italian and i have a seven euro mocha machine since 20 years 
So <laughs> very good Excellent. coffee. It's mocha. It's very good coffee. And and yeah, but but I have stocks in in Amazon, Apple, Tesla, and Google. <laughs> Uh, and so, yeah, that, these are small decisions every day that accumulate over years and over decades. And they, as you say, they make a difference over decades. Yes. And when I think if you look at it, you're 53% of Americans live month to month. 40% of people in the UK live month to month and they cannot survive a month without income. Like financial and money management skills are lacking incredibly in our society. And that's what my wife and I are working to do. Our course starts on the 26th of April. It's completely free. We're doing it to give back to the world to help people get on top of their finances because you're right, that gap is increasing. And it's not to do with the system. It's to do with how people manage their money. And there is a way to change that and get on top of your own finances if you want to. So if any of your audience want to come along and play, we would welcome them and we'd love to help them get on top of their finances. Please, people, go to Ellen Donegan and do it. Also, Ellen, how can we get this into elementary school, into college, into where it belongs at the very beginning of financial responsibility? This, this has been something I've been working on for a long time and I just... I struggle with this. My worst year in business, Simon, ever was when I tried to sell to schools because schools don't have any money or necessarily the resource to be able to pay someone to come in and give proper education on finance and business to their students. And the other side of this is that educational institutes think they do start up education. So they won't work with outside people because they think they already deliver the best entrepreneurial education out there. And it's a battle I've been fighting, but I haven't figured it out either. I would love to help people at a young age get on top of their finances. What I've actually learned is I have to wait for them to get out of education, get a job, find some stuff they don't like and have some pain so that then they come to me later. Uh, I have not found a way to solve that one yet. I would love to. That, yeah, that is wise. Uh, to start after one initial pain because then things reshift and your perspective changes on what is important. Yes. What are three books that inspire you? Uh, so the th three books that have inspired me, actually the first one that set me on my entire self-development journey, I was 21 years old. I just lost my job, my parents were getting divorced and my girlfriend dumped me. It was the worst time in my life ever. And I decided to go to Brazil and sit on a beach. And my friend handed me Notes from a Friend by Tony Robbins. It's a very mm. short book and it completely changed the way I looked at life. It helped me set some goals. And that one book changed the direction of my life. It's a very entry level self-development book, but it at that time changed everything. Um, in terms of financial independence, the one that really helped me was by J.L. Collins. He wrote The Simple Path to Wealth. And we, my wife and I, have uh, implemented his strategies, and that's what's helped us to get where we are. He's an incredible author and a fabulous guy. Um, and the final one, which helped shift my thinking, I never managed to implement it, as he said, was the four hour work week with Tim Ferriss. Um, I never managed to build a muse. But his thinking, his way of looking at the life helped me change the way I looked at life and it had a massive impact. So those would be the three books, Notes from a Friend, Simple Path to Wealth and The Four Hour Work Week. Beautiful. And so we know now how to um, get to financial freedom. I also am super interested about how you got to be above your business, to work on the business, not in the business, after one word from our sponsors. Hey, if you love what you are hearing, you will love our free masterclasses. Go grab them at strategiesprints.com. Because here's the catch. We want freedom. We, we build our own venture. And then we are run by our venture instead of running our venture. How did you get out of that? 
<laughs> well, it took eight to nine years. So this was not a simple process and it took a lot of thinking. I think the thing that got me was this concept of the revolver test. Have you heard of the revolver test, Simon? Mm -mm. So the idea is it's a, it's a thought experiment. So please don't actually do this. It's a thought experiment. You put a revolver or a gun to the head of the business owner and you imagine pulling the trigger and if the business survives without the owner, you've passed the revolver test. If the business dies with the owner, you've failed the revolver test. So what I did, and I did this by accident, not consciously, but it was a good strategy, was I would take two months off to go and do something else and then see if the business would survive without me. And like the first few times I did that, it caused massive problems it failed in different areas and then i was able to see which areas it failed in and we were able to work to get over that the the last time i did that i took two months off went to la to write a movie and the business lost money and i came back and i was very unhappy and the people who worked with me were very unhappy and we had to work out why did that happen and the process of working out what went wrong and I think business owners are quite often so afraid of letting people make mistakes that they control everything and then they will never be free. You have to let people make their own mistakes and it's going to cost you some money. It's going to be painful, but people will learn and you will make progress. I am such a control freak when I hear that. I, I went <laughs> away for two months. I was like, ah! So, and on the other side... Um, I'm, I'm also now uh, working more on the business than in the business. I'm not in fulfillment anymore. And in most roles, I'm, I'm not in there. I, I have found a, a, a way that fits my controlling nature, which is creating a lot of quality loops. So we have processes, we have SOPs, we have a full manual. We, con we call it the sprint playbook where everything is tracked. So if one person is on holiday, the other can take over. And, and I look at that playbook very, very often and see if it's healthy, if it's working, if it's updated, then I can let go. I love and, that. Uh, yeah. It, it, but it is so important that very early on, especially if we are service businesses, we are experts, then we think the business is us. It's not. The impact is it. And, and that's not you, that's uh, a set of things that you have developed that are in your head, but you can get them out of, their, of your head. Like you write a book, you can create a set of practices and you can teach it others. Yes, 100%. I totally agree. And uh, we think it's ego, it's ego that we think we, we are it. Uh, it's, it it's, it's not we, it's what we do. I, I fired myself and I have now certified strategy sprints coaches doing the work and they do it much better than I ever did. And I thought I am the star. I, I am not. Everybody is the star. I am, I am not How a galaxy. How did you fire yourself? How did that meeting go? Did you come in and go, Simon, you're fired? Uh, did you make yourself a nice coffee and sit yourself down? Did you, How did you fire yourself? I don't have an expensive coffee machine, so it was a cheap coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a very small one because I'm an Italian, so espresso. And it's like your your revolver exercise. It was a mental exercise. Hey, do you ever want to go on holidays very long? Yeah. Well, then you should start doing something. <laughs> yes. And and it was out of a crisis, which is easier to change when you're in a crisis. So basically, the crisis was. I had one more client that wanted to work with us and I couldn't deliver because I was the bottleneck. So it was very clear I have to remove myself from that bottleneck position. Otherwise, I am hindering our own, our own business in growing. It, uh, so I realized it quite late, but uh, that was the best thing to fire myself from fulfillment and to do only orchestrating and growth activities. 
I love that. I think everyone listening to this should uh, do a mental thought experiment and fire themselves and see what happens. Uh, I think that's a fantastic piece of advice. <laughs> and what one also one important so one important thing is that you write down all processes. Another one is that you write down the vision, what you stand for, and why you do it, because in there you describe what the things are that 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 really uh, serve as a foundation for the for your decisions. So if when you decide what what do you take what what do you decide uh, based upon what which values which priorities so where can people find out more about you uh, so there's several places if it's about entrepreneurship the two places are the rebel business school that's running free courses on entrepreneurship around the world and the rebel entrepreneur podcast that's the home of how to start a business with no debt. Uh, and then if it's about money and finance, I have my own website, which is alandonegan.com. And you'll see the Rebel Finance School and you'll see all the stuff my wife and I do about finance and helping people get in charge of their money. So just Google me, Alan Donegan, spelt the normal way. Super cool. Everybody, Google Alan Donegan. This is amazing. This is good stuff. It is against the grain and it is and it is truth. That's exactly what an entrepreneur finds out after many years of struggling. And you don't have to have the same mistakes and struggles. You can learn directly. So cool to have you here, Ellen. And uh, who should be my next guest? Oh, who should be your next guest? Uh, I thought, actually, the two people, Katie and Andrew from Time Trap Escape Rooms, I think it would be really interesting to interview them about how they built the business with no debt and were able to borrow a building. Um, or my business partner, Simon Payne. He's a little bit strange, but he's very interesting. And I will ask him if uh, you, you, you fixed him or he fixed you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you must ask him that. I'd love to hear his answer. It won't be true, though. Anyone listening, do not believe a word he says. And I want him to come with the T-shirt of your mom with her picture. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get that printed for him with my mom's face saying, if you don't ask, you don't get. Ellen Donegan, everybody. Thank you so much for being here, sharing your journey, your wisdom with us. Please come back soon. Avoid trying to do thousands of things that doesn't work. We have 274 templates for your business success. Reach your ambitious goals with one-on-one -on -one sprint coach. We double